here in the back there. We kind of have this projecting into the back. You okay? Good. Uh, welcome to PAV. Welcome to this evening, um, this amazing evening. I'm so glad to see you all here. Um, PAV, as most of you, many of you know, is a non-profit non collective uh, devoted to poetry, innovative poetry in all of its forms. Uh, we organize poetry readings, interdisciplinary arts events, and all sorts of fun stuff from September through May every year. So for this evening's event, which is our first in our regular reading series for the season, we're proud to present an incredible duo of poets. Here, here. Ophelia, <laughs> that's right, Ophelia Savannah and Charles Bernstein. Um, this evening, uh, our programming is supported by this beautiful space, uh, Sculpture Tucson. Barbara and Robin have been so helpful in making this happen. So again, cheers to Sculpture Tucson. Thank you so much. We also would like to thank the Arizona Commission for the Arts, uh, the UA Poetry Center. Thank you, Tyler. Poets and writers. Uh, the University of Arizona English Department, and Chats Press. Thank you, Chats. <laughs> We'd also like to thank all of you. Thank you for supporting us. Um, if you like what we're doing, if you want to see more of what we're doing, um, you can donate what you can at the door, through PayPal, through our website. Um, there's all sorts of opportunities to help us. So, um, so please, uh, if you're feeling like it, please donate. So, as you all know, this evening is an event that's open to everyone, and POG strives to make our events a welcoming and a safe space for all. So, if this is not your experience tonight, uh, please let one of the POG board members, who are now raising their hands, please let them know if that's not your experience. And, and as we start off tonight, I'd also like to acknowledge that we're gathered today on the traditional territory of the Tohono O'odham and Pasquayaki nations. It's an honor to be here tonight with all of you on this land and together. And thank you all for being here and being together. So tonight our two readers will be introduced by our POG board members, Lisa uh, Periali Martin and Charles Alexander. And Lisa, I'm gonna hand the mic over to you. Thank you. Thank you all. So, is it off now? It's off. Yeah. It's off. Just get, Just get okay. real close. Get yeah. really close. It's okay. punk rock. <laughs> I'm kind of feeling like with this crowd, Ophelia Zepeda probably needs no introduction, but um, it's going to be kind of nice to say a few things about her anyway. Um, I love her work. She's an amazing professor, um, poet, linguist. She has a PhD <coughs> in linguistics, so I think you could also call her Dr. Zepeda. And, um, she writes about her community, her life, the, um, the clouds and the rain and the desert, and so, so much meaning there for desert dwellers. And um, she recently spoke at a church I attend erratically, the Unitarian Church. And, um, I, what really stuck with me was her comment that uh, academics will speak of dead languages. And she um, remarked that Native people would not use that language, that they would say the languages are resting. And that meant a lot to me. Um, you can find her work you know, on the internet and books and um, even on the streets of Tucson, there are boulders between the 
Roger and Fort Lowell on Mountain that have her work in English and Opta and I love how she carries her language into the community and is supporting that language, the life of that language through her poetry and um, it's a beautiful day. So look forward to you sharing it with us tonight. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much for the, the lovely uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to talk to you about what I'm going to say. I'm going to talk to you about what I'm going to say. And I'm going to talk to you about what I'm going to say. I'm going to talk to you about what I'm going to say. I'm going to talk to you about what I'm going to say. When you are in the past, 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 you are so often I know last year invited me and, it, and my schedule just didn't work out. I'm glad it did this time around. Um, also, of course, in, uh, in autumn, I just express my appreciation for the invitation and to be here with all of you and to share my work with you uh, this evening. And that I hope uh, you find some, you know, some of the, the beauty and uh, and the things that I, I uh, put down here in writing for myself and then for anyone who wants to uh, to hear it or read it when it's out there. Um, so uh, this evening um, I uh, chose a few things. I start with, uh, of course, the land uh, here where we're at, as was mentioned, and acknowledge the autumn and of course our uh, neighbors, the Yaki, the, the Yaki community, um, the desert that we all live in. So I start, of course, in the language, and I start with the land, and then I sort of shift to the people, and I end with the land again. I'm kai the kim siarik tagio, I'm kai the kim jupin tagio, I'm kai the kim wakarim tagio. I'm a child to get shag in mom kai the kim sapo, e with the sapo of stick to the skirt with your yan again yea, the judge we go ya and again yea, ka a jaka jump shoot up the mea but ka a jaka a jagos, the mea but ka a jig skill towards the mea but. In the midst of songs, we hear the songs resounding, they are resounding toward the sunset, they are resounding toward the sunrise, they are resounding toward the north, they are resounding toward the south. We are in the midst of songs, our heart is full of joy, our mind is good, our land is good. The land is all beautiful, take a look. There is a light rain all around, take a look. We hear the ocean in the distance, it has come near us. We hear the beautiful wind in the distance, it has come near us. We hear the dust storm in the distance, it has come near us. We hear a beautiful song in the distance, it has come near us. We hear a beautiful song in the distance, it has come upon us. So this one again is uh, here in, in Tucson. Um, I'm sure many of you have been, been in this area, in the, the Tucson Mountains. And this piece is called Ocotillo Memorial. And um, it's based on a, um, a, a little event uh, where we came upon a little memorial someone put up out in the desert. And so I just describe the memorial. And then I add 
additional knowledge that I know of the uh, region and the Tucson International Airport. Altitia Memorial. Walking in the desert, we come upon a memorial site, Holy Family Candle, long melted. Photograph of a young woman with dangling earrings. Her memory marked by a stand of Ocotillo. In spring, they will burst orange, red blossoms. Branches will bend forward. Birds, insects will visit. All around her are the Tucson Mountains, brown, mottled volcanic stone sand guard. This string of mountains flight path for Tucson International Airport. On approach, the cabin becomes quiet. Passengers buckle up. Tray tables are stowed. Seats are in upright position. The plane flies low above the memorial site, acknowledging the woman with the dangling earrings. <laughs> and I've flown in over that. At least a regular route. <laughs> I'm going to continue. Uh, 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 another woman uh, piece. Um, I've been uh, writing pieces uh, with, um, on projects, and um, uh, so this was uh, one of them, uh, and I just called it A Moment of Fire, and this, I did this when uh, uh, California, well California always has tremendous fires in the summer, but one summer it was particularly bad, and I was flying to, um, in that region, and I saw the smoke and the flames, and and I watched a woman sleeping on a plane, and, and this is about her. I just call it Woman of Fire. Even though I call her a girl, I think. The girl in flight rests her head on the wall of the plane. Her silhouette is defined by the brilliance of an Arizona sunset. The fiery glow cushions her head. Her tired sleep moves her to dreams of origins. She dreams of fire. She is innately aware of the structure of embers, their warmth, and the invitation they can hold. She shifts in her chair and moves into a deeper sleep. The evolution of her dreams take her deep to the fire she is made of. Her dreams are restless with heat. She has the rage of flames like all the women before her. In her waking, she finds her voice of flames, and she speaks. Um, and a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to work with a project. Um, and they asked me to run uh, writing workshops for all of them women. And it was affiliated with the Presbyterian churches that are on the Autumn Reservation and the Gila River Indian Reservation. And um, uh, they had uh, external funding. Well, the funding was uh, through a nonprofit organization. And um, so I had, was able to spend a couple of days with these women. And the project was to have these women uh, look at literature, Christian literature, and traditional art of literature, and then sort of bring those belief systems together in poetry. So it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Most of the discussion was very, very interesting, um, because all of them were predominantly Catholic, so that was interesting too. <laughs> the, the Presbyterian women, because we used the church, so these ladies had the keys to the buildings, so I knew they, you know, they were Presbyterian. <laughs> They were raised Catholic, their parents were Catholic, and so they knew that as well. And then of course they were traditional autumn women, so they knew that as well. And to bring all of that together was just really amazing. And all of them I found, and which sort of uh, confirmed what I always thought, all of them are very open to religions. They sort of like take them, take pieces of it, and, and make it their own. Um, so it was a lot of fun talking 
to them about you know their beliefs, what they know about traditional art and their own practices, and um, uh, how it blends in with the, their you know, uh, Christian uh, sense of their world. So anyway, so they wrote things, and we published two little uh, books of their work, and I wrote along with them, and. Um, you know, I took excerpts from the Bible, and I'm not a good Bible reader, so I had to like brush up on all of that. But at the same time, the one of my Christian literature people is somebody like Johnny Cash. You know, he's, he sings hymns and gospels, you know. So that's sort of my background. So I brought all of that together, and somehow it worked. Um, anyway, so like I said, I uh, wrote with them. And this piece, we were talking about uh, creation. The uh, belief of creation, what we know, how we came to be here, and of course what is in the Bible. And um, so we went back and forth and we of course mushed it all together and it made sense for us. So I wrote this little piece about um, the formation of the earth basically. And uh, it's a bilingual uh, piece. And there's some parts of it that doesn't make sense, but uh, maybe you might ignore that. So anyway, the title is Sistrivich Silpi, A Cold and Cloudy Day. Our Sistrivich Silpi the Devatar, Mushokai to be George, Mother Nossi Tonari, Nyan and Tonari. Our Sistrivich Silpi the Devatar, Mushomar to be George, the Tam Kachum Stuart. Yeah, from God to be joy to damn God to. Our sister get silly to get a dash, but of God to be joy, will sit to the boy, new wee he he, in half of God and a long end that skirt and key that it at a dash, must his joy be silly. A cloud, a cold and cloudy day, and that is a line from a Johnny Cash song. <laughs> a cold and cloudy day. It was a cold and cloudy day when God said, let there be light. So there was light. It was a cold and cloudy day when God made heaven and earth. And so there was heaven and earth. It was a cold and cloudy day when God said, come to me, there is a better life here for all. On a cold and cloudy day. So. Anyway, so the part that doesn't make sense is a cold and cloudy day when he was just making the day, you know. But I believe that it, that day that he was making things was a cold and cloudy day. <laughs> That's my version. Um, and also, one of the last uh, workshops that we did happened to be the day after um, the shooting um, in Uvalde, Texas, with all the children at the school. So we wrote a group poem for that, and then each of us wrote different pieces for the children and the parents um, from the horrible um, thing that happened there. So this is my piece for, for the children at um, the, the school in uh, Uvalde, Texas. And it's just called The Boy in the Striped Shirt, because there was a little image of, a little picture of one of the boys, and he had this little blue striped shirt. A little boy in a striped shirt started his journey too soon. The little girl, an honor, an honor student, started her journey too soon. They will not be there for morning roll call. Their names will echo in the halls of the schools from when they were last called. The sign of the school reads, the school will remain closed in the meantime. In the meantime, when mothers and fathers cry and pound on the brick walls, one answers. In the meantime, when some families curse God for bringing harm to children, forsaking their faith. In the meantime, when fathers and mothers finally understand their children are in the full grace of God, and their holiness transcends everything and surrounds those left behind. <clears throat> and then also.
also, um, in one of the last workshops, we talked about death and how Christianity deals with death and how they practice, you know, the whole process of death and dying. And then how all of them do it. That's very, that, that was the most, the topic to me that diverged the most. Um, but it still was interesting to talk about and to end up um, writing uh, about. So um, I'll share this last one from that, uh, those workshops. And it's just called Visiting Souls, which, you know, All Souls Day is coming up, first part of uh, November for those that uh, acknowledge that. Visiting Souls, we want to be with you even though you have left. We speak of you and build on our memories of you. We remember your gait, the shape of your hands, that recognizable posture. We see someone walking down the road and a memory flashes back. We smile, sometimes we cry. We cry for you for a long, long time. We want to be with you even though you have left. We visit your resting place every chance we get. The day of all souls is just for you. We remember you more then. We choose your favorite foods and drink sweets, feast food, coffee, traditional food. All the food history of your life is placed on the table for you. We remember the foods because we remember you. We hold you close, always. We talk to you when we need you. We ask for guidance from the wisdom we know you had. We are happy knowing you are our ancestor and that we are the ones you prayed for. But the other ladies, that, and they were all ladies too, they were Presbyterian ladies. Um, they were really nice pieces as well. Um, so now I'm going to shift the, uh, over to uh, my favorite subject, which is always the land and the landscape here in the desert. And I uh, wanted to share some of those with you. And uh, this one's called Lavender Clouds, and it's just an image I um, saw, was sort of was taking in from a hotel window um, over on the, I think it was the Gila River Indian Reservation, maybe Salt River. Uh, Lavender Clouds, yeah, Salt River. Red Mountain is blue in dawn's light. It is gold trimmed with lavender highlights. The casino at Salt River faces east for Don's blessing. Buses in the parking lot below park facing east. Birds in flight knowingly turn their little heads in measured unison and glance toward the east, murmuring a bird prayer. In honor of dawn, in honor of dawn. Mesquite trees bordering the parking lot also face east and stand quiet. Their little leaves move in mesquite prayer in honor of dawn. I am taught to pray before anything casts a shadow on earth. This is the purest time of the day. This is in honor of dawn, in honor of dawn. And, then, and those are, um, it is true that is the practice, right, early in the morning. Um, rock drawings. And here, I just imagined a story that rock drawings, a certain group of rock drawings that I viewed outside of uh, Gila Bend, Arizona. Um, I just made up a story of uh, the people that might have left the drawings on the rocks and uh, what they had to say of others coming through. Rock drawings. This would have been a good place to pass through. There is water nearby. People passing through would have left marks on rocks to say, we came through here. Or people would have, might have left a symbol to stay. 
stayed here for one season or stayed on this side of the mountain. And we will see you in two or more seasons. In the worst of times, whatever that might have been, floods, famine, signs were left that said, please don't follow us. We need to be on our own. This is how we will survive. It goes on to say, we will resemble you, we will resemble you in many ways, but over time there will be differences. Those differences will make us strong. We will remember the songs, prayers, and language we were given. Over time, they will change too. The essence, parts of the rhythm, will always remind us of you when we left. We didn't want to leave. We had to leave. To survive, we had to leave. Well, I don't know that was right to say that, but. Right. There were a lot of drawings, and I forget they told a big story. <laughs> so I, made, I gave up their story. So, um, and um, there's a, one that I do want to share um, that appeared in the, the little anthology. Oh, well, it's not actually, it was an anthology by a friend uh, Poetry Center, Tyler and his colleagues uh, edited on uh, the vaccine, it's called Dear Vaccine. And this poem that, to me, it seemed to get a lot of mileage uh, uh, was featured in uh, different events that uh, associated with the collection. And um, for the all of them, it was very interesting and of course very hard as you might imagine native people uh, were heavily impacted by the pandemic um, you know, for a lot of different reasons and so and, and I found it interesting in that the um, when the pandemic first happened the the autumn had to do this really quick PSAs, public service announcements on the radio, posters, and so forth. And so language had to be created very quickly to be able to talk about something like a pandemic. But a lot of them have been through pandemics uh, historically. So they had a history in a way. Um, they have, you know, they just have a phrase like a big sickness, which means something really serious. So this was kind of, you know, fell under that category. But when they talked about, um, you know, the six foot distance between people and so forth. Um, and all of them don't like to use numbers. They won't, they won't measure things so specifically. They just give you a general idea. And um, so they had, so they would explain it in, in those senses, the, the way that people understand. And uh, anyway, I, and I, as someone who looks at language, I found it very interesting how, how the language immediately handled the concepts, and especially uh, explaining how dangerous it was and that it was necessary to protect yourself, and this is how you do it, and, and people had to uh, obey, you know, um, the steps and so forth. So, so it was awkward because people are a hand, uh, all of them are a handshaking group. They, you know, that's how you greet uh, one another by right? shaking hands. So you couldn't do that anymore for for a long time. And some, we, some of us still don't shake hands as much as we used to. It's how dear vaccine in all them is Quran Shambai Masma. We meet you and shake your hand in greeting. It has been some time since we shook anyone's hand. We are happy to see you. We have been waiting for your arrival for some time. Your journey is done. You will now rest in our bodies. Like other healers before you, you'll be there when we need you. 
The tale of your journey will be held in our collective stories. We will retell it next year when we acknowledge the death anniversaries of our relatives and friends and all those who tried to fight the enemy alone. We will tell of the battles you fought on your journey, the battles against non-believers and conspiracy theorists. You will be known as a hero, a slayer of enemies, and like so many others before you, you will be known by many names. So that was the vaccine and my piece for the vaccine. Um, and then finally just coming back to the desert and uh, I want to end with uh, just the two pieces about the desert and I know this is an experience that many of you have had in your lifetime or if you live here in this area or know someone who has in my dreams. Havelina, I came to the house again. I sensed the urge, come see the Havelina. And between wake and sleep, I rise without hesitation. I anticipate seeing them walking down the street as in previous experiences. This time, they are on the front porch, a small herd. Some are enjoying the store of bird seeds while others wait and wait their turn or hold watch. On that night, their wildness crosses over into my domesticity. Or maybe it was the other way around. The Havelina and I acknowledge this is our homeland and our paths will intersect again. Returning to bed, I don't sleep. Havelina kicked holes in my dreams. Light shines through. The scent of wildness hangs in the air. So, I know that many people have had that experience. <laughs> so, um, and the last one about, again, the wildness and spirituality of indigenous people and distinct places, especially here in the Southwest, the tribes here in the Southwest, and what they know of these special places. Um, and, um, and again, it's just a separation of, just a little bit of a view of these special places and how uh, Europeans, you know, upon early arrival, saw these magical places, whether it was the Grand Canyon or Yosemite or something like that. Um, and when they talk about um, uh, the, I mean, it's hard to, to, to put in words the, the beauty of the place. And um, the common phrase is, sublime, the sublime landscape. Um, I call it the home of the sacred. And I have a little quote, the sublime landscape, were those rare places on earth where one had, had more chance than elsewhere to glimpse the face of God. And we find that in literature, European literature, and we want to talk about these places. The sublime landscape is not a place to catch a glimpse. These places are where the creators, gods, deities, and powerful beings live. And while Gerlik Eitoi's home is found, Autumn climbed a peak to be in the goodness of the creator. At Mauna Kea, the goddess Pele resides. Hawaiians climb a volcano and humble themselves there. At San Francisco Peaks near Flagstaff, Katsinas and Yebichi spirits live. They climb down the mountain blessed with songs and prayers when Navajo and Hopi call them. In the Grand Canyon, many gods, deities, and powerful beings stay in these rock walls and cliffs holding vigil for their people. In this powerful place, are all these sacred beings, the Wallapai, the Havasupai, the Hopi, Amabu, and others know they are there. The, the people simply don't catch a glimpse of holy beings. 
they sing them, they pray them in these places. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Grace and generosity. Charles Bernstein might in a poem say something like, wake up! Or, it's not what you think it is. Or, it's not what I think it is. Or, it's not what it is. Oh, we've never had a break between readers. Almost never. You think it'd be a good idea? Okay, I promise I won't start over again when I come back. <laughs> okay. Wake up! <laughs> okay, take take a few minutes. Then a brief break. Taking your seats again. A little reminder, not please not to set anything on the sculpture pedestals. Okay. So what did I say? I said it louder, but, but some of the things Charles asked us to do or to consider how we might wake up, how we might consider it is not what we think it is. It is not what it thinks it is. It may not be even what it is. To me, these questions in his poems are acts of generosity. That's why I start with generosity and grace. And also because in the 45 years I've known him, I feel like my, on the receiving end of that relationship, I have wonderfully received much generosity and grace, whether that was Charles making me the first martini I ever had. Wow. That's a, yes. Damn. Or, or my favorite moment, uh, I think, at a, at a conference in New York on Louis Zukowski, and he waved me over. He said, he, he said come on, I'll take you to lunch. I'll take you to lunch. Next thing I knew, we had walked several blocks. We were in his apartment, and he made me a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> I think generosity and grace. Um, I wrote an introduction for Charles almost exactly three years ago which is long and literate and no. elegant, if I do say so, is. which is on the uh, Jacket 2 website. And I'm just not going to repeat all that kind of stuff. You know, I thought about just saying, I don't have enough words. And so just Charles Bernstein. And so just Charles Bernstein. And not Three years ago, I was supposed to read here with Baby a verse group of my great friend, and uh, we did it online. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry not to come then, and when I was asked to come back. I was very happy too, but I uh, could not have imagined the honor to read with Ophelia. It's a very different kind of tone, as you'll hear, but I hope you'll also hear ways that they create a syncretic unreality. Um, so this piece is a little longer than I would usually read because I've been working on it for some years and I want to read the whole thing here uh, for the first time. Uh, it's called Pre-Owned Poems. <laughs> the translations, except noted, are mine and the quotations of which I am aware are attributed. My heart has been broken so many times I think it would hurt more if it was put back together. <laughs> a good poet throws nothing out except the eggshells and coffee grounds. A great poet doesn't even throw those out. Sunk into a morass of my own unmaking. I don't think you've ever start over just again. Form is content by other means. Where are the hiding places hiding? Leonard Cohn, beautiful losers. Redemption is recognition the present has passed, coming awake in its wake. 
The kind of poetry I want intensifies sense in its futile effort to negate social reality. Don't trust anybody over 40. <laughs> Don't trust anybody over 30 or under 40. <laughs> Topicality is the mirage of quicksand. Unless other voices wake us, we drown. I wouldn't join a group that agreed with what I said. The dead cannot return, but we can tune into their echoes so that they can come to life in us. Poetry is not a second language, it's the first. All else follows. It's the way we travel across time, or better to say, travel in time, dwelling in the nick of time. For Carolyn Bergvall's The Metal. All shtick is local. <laughs> so here's my Proust translation. The idea of a popular art, like a patriotic art, if it has not been dangerous, to me seemed ridiculous. If it was made to render it accessible to the people, so sacrificing the refinements of the form, good for idlers, I have frequented the gentry enough to know that they are veritable illiterates and not the electrical workers. To this point, a popular art form would have been destined above all for the members of the jockey, not for those of the General Confederation of Workers. On this subject, popular novels are as boring to common people as children books, as children's books are to those they are written for. <laughs> when you address everyone like they say you address no one, not even no one, but those no ones seem to know not. A melting pot is to multicultural homogeneity as a bricklayer is to cement. Hold tight! Hold tight, hold tight. <laughs> Leonard Ware, Sidney Bechet. <laughs> Years scribbling day and night, flash awards, public light, does not make a poet quite. Give a person the truth, and they will put on a mask. Sponsored, topsy turvy, newly unmastered. Socially sourced poems made from 100% recycled materials, matured in seasoned oak pitch, charred before filling to, to impart a piquant, indefensible nuttiness. <laughs> Line breaks are thoughts inflections. I break for art, <laughs> in the biblical sense of the word. <laughs> Write not what you know but what you can find out. Some see a glass half empty. Others see it completely empty. <laughs> Perception is nine tenths of the flaw, law. What a topsy turvy world. This is my translation of Heine's Verkerte Velta. What a topsy turvy world. We tread on our heads while shepherds are bred to be fleeced by the sheep, calves roast cooks, ponies ride on phonies, and the right to be taught freedom of thought is toasted with Catholic Negronis. <laughs> Catholic. And Negroni martini. This is Heiner Kahn. Don't blame me. <laughs> a Jewish museum without Jewish artists, New York. A Jewish museum without Jews, Poland. Waiting for my stomach to get its sea legs. Names ache, Maggie O'Sullivan. As my father liked to say, you can't serve soup with a slotted spoon. In other words, I don't want poems that can't hold their aesthetic water. An era of the ear, an ear for the era. More, more of my translation of Proust. 
literature which contents itself with describing things to give a miserable resume of their lines and their surface is, despite its realist pretensions, the most distant from reality, that which impoverishes and saddens us most. It speaks only of glory and grandeur because it brusquely breaks from the it, because it brusquely breaks from all communication from ourself present with the past, in which things guard their essence and the future, where they incite us to taste it again. You are going to have a good time whether you like it or not. You've received this email because of your interest in Panacea Productions. <laughs> if you don't wish to get updates from us, please reply to this email so we can add your verified address to our internet marketing list. <laughs> Not worth the vapor it's printed on. There's not enough coffee in the coffee. <laughs> Sponsored. Topsy-turvy. Quote, a more impudent attempt at humbugging the public with gimmicks and tricks has never been exercised. Immaculata Schwartz, Academy of American Poetry Writing Programs. <laughs> Disfluency precedes fluency. The influence of anxiety. If a poet doesn't feel unjustly neglected or misunderstood by both the mainstream and avant-garde, ideal readers and the elite, hoi polloi too, the poet is either not paying attention or doing something terribly wrong. You've got agreement, I've got agreement. To serve man, the alien said on the Twilight Zone, yes. referring to a cookbook. Fast forward, Republican Party, USA. You know who you are. I remain confused on this point. In the absence of right or wrong, blame rules. Even a broken clock is right once in a blue moon. Chiliastic, a mellow form of sexual gratification involving cold compresses. <laughs> Chiliastic. So, sometimes you need to take the horns of the dilemma without the bull. Let's not even get into the hormones of a dilemma. Don't amortize my love. The next morning, I woke up groggy. It took me a few minutes to realize where I was. Even then, I couldn't be sure. There was an empty bottle of gin in the bed. I tried to shave, but my right hand was shaking, and the mirror looked cracked. I called downstairs for a pot of coffee, then started to write this entry before it would turn into a blur. The phone rang. It was you. Are Jews a folly of God, or God a folly of Jews? After Nietzsche. Trollope. To a man not accustomed to thinking, there is nothing in the world so difficult as to think. Fairness without justice is tyranny. In other words, don't let generalizations become generals. The syncretic precedes the authentic, just as sublimity precedes beauty for Will Alexander. At the end of the day, you have to decide what kind of poet you are. A big heart and a small brain. A big brain and a small heart. I've got affect, you've got emotion. I've got feeling, you've got identity. I've got voices, you've got voice. Taste maps Arab syndrome, our sin 
drone. Free will is too expensive, except as a quid pro quo. As dog whistles become pig whistles, I just drink my whiskey. My first loyalty is those who oppose and actively resist the Republican Party, USA, Bolsonaro and company, the Isla Tola and his guard, the Tatmandu, Putin, etc. You're only young once, if that. You're only old once too, at most. When I was young, I felt middle-aged. Old, I see. That was exactly the sign of my youth. <laughs> so this is from Cervantes Don Quixote, translated by Edith Grossman, who died recently. And I titled it Diversity Train. When the two of them were going to sit down at the table, the farmer insisted that the nobleman should sit at the head of the table. And the nobleman also insisted that the farmer should sit there, because in his house, his orders had to be followed. But the farmer, who was proud of his courtesy and manners, refused to do it, until the nobleman became angry, and putting both hands on his shoulder, he forced him to sit down at the head of the table, saying, sit down, you imbecile. Wherever I sit will be the head of the table for you. <laughs> Diversity training. Responsibilities are for parents, teachers and citizens, not for poets. Poetry abhors responsibility to the degree it is infatuated with responsiveness, after Robert Duncan. All poetry is loco. Anti-binary is binary. There are no absolutes, but there ought to be. Why is Jewface more acceptable than blackface? Does not a Jew bleed, even if he's pricked? I prefer to see non-Jews playing Jews in the movies. I don't think a Jew can play a Jew in a convincing way. <laughs> Looking to the future where we're able to have non-humans play humans, I think we will find the same thing. <laughs> Before starting your poem, check to be sure there is enough available darkness. <laughs> If you've got the time, we've got the beer. B I E R. <laughs> Johann Gottlieb Fricke, born May 19, 1762, to a family of ribbon makers. No good poem goes unpunished. The Literary Academy is too often governed by mechanisms of discipline, control, and hierarchy, often while ostensibly critiquing discipline, control, and hierarchy. Desire seems to be to turn the humanities into a kind of pseudoscience, but restricting references to a small group of professionally sanctioned words or styles in more the product of faddish hegemony and rationalization than any engagement with science. Just because someone is anti-Semitic is not a reason to assume they are not. My optimism gives me the resilience to reject hope. Sponsored, pre-owned poems is brought to you by the Center for Avant-Garde Comedy and Stand-Up Poetry, the first church poetic license, and by listeners like you. <laughs> Proust again, one can only imagine what's absent. Just so. One cannot imagine what is present. Maybe the Orphic is not creating the world imagined, but acknowledging it. I imagine nothing, but am imagined by it. Melancholy is grief interrupted. Toggle to stay alive in experience. Damaged goods are better than rancid ones. Damage, at least, is in sight of repair. Universalism is relativism with a Christianizing fate. Reb O'Boy was asked if Traif, Traif is non-kosher. Reb O'Boy was asked if Traif could be included in a poem. Poetry is neither kosher nor Traif. It is commentary. 
People who like that Akrasu also like this one. Don't sue me just because you don't like the soup. John Felsner told me of plans for a Norton anthology of Jewish American literature. What will you include of Gertrude Stein? We're not sure if we will include her. Isn't that like an anthology of Irish literature, not including <laughs> Joyce? The left hand must not know even what the left hand is doing. <laughs> if there is a place for a comfort poem, there is also a place for a discomfort poem. Comforted poems quickly strays. Discomfort stays. Poems left on lifts, trains, platforms, buses, cabs, planes, theaters, and playgrounds, and not reclaimed. I bow down to no one, not even gods, but I'll talk to anyone, even devils. Everything is relative. You mean we're all relatives? No, we're all different. Yes, my relatives are a lot like that. It is just because of the crisis of social, racial, and economic justice of the environment, the crisis for democracy, that, poets mu that poetry must go beyond the superficial and reductive and find ways of reflecting on the world we share so that we may change the world rather than submitting to it. The struggle is over reality. Who owns it? Who controls it? The only thing worse than aesthetics is its absence. The future is never future. It's not even present. No more Russian dressing on my Caesar salad. <laughs> With so much anti-this and anti-that, what possible difference does a bit of anti-Semitism make after music? The, present, the presence of what's past, the past in what's present. I can't get past the past any more than I can break loose from time. But in the meantime, I mark the present with inadvertent rhymes. Historicism abhors relativism by framing universalism. Truth is a local product of time, not an export product. What we've been forced to confront so long denied is American unexceptionalism. Truth is wounded by time. Its blood is historical materiality. Its scar, art. Do not be a magician. Be magic. Leonard Cohen, beautiful losers. Truth wounds time. That's its music. The place of refuge is no refuge. This is the story of the Jews today. Sponsor, topsy-turvy, select, don't settle. Angels brush against spattered brushwork. Gory purple eyes loom out amidst hearts pierced by arrows for Susan B. Spare the child and spoil the rod. Even a broken pot is right twice a day. I am for imaginative intelligence and for the intelligence of imagination. Social justice is not hitting my head on the nail. The memory of memory, the hope for hope. Discretion is 99, 44, 100 percent of the law. What happens in the poem stays in the poem. Sponsor, topsy turvy, all work done on premise. Magic is to poetry what yoga is to birds. <laughs> the poem-like language has an agency that is different from mine. I don't pursue a poem, it pursues me. 
Silence is time without rhythm, Claude Rochon in conversation. Everything happens for a reason, and sometimes that reason is no reason. I feel so gay in a melancholy way. Oscar Hammerstein II. Sitting in the sun, watching the pig run. Neither nor no. And those that came to scan remained to sway. Poetry, essay, and translations, while distinct genres, form the woven texture of both my own poesis and that of the traditions that I continue. The activities are complementary. I am not an advocate of breaking down genres, even if I sometimes write poem essays. It's more a duck rabbit problem. You can read it either way, and the work is different depending on the choice. But best not to read it as both. I prefer the possibility that one frame excludes the other. Poetry's freedom is not in its social policy positions, but in its imaginary enactments. A poem can have power and agency that the, that the person writing the poem cannot. Poetry, especially conventional poetry, often embodies and celebrates popular understandings. But the kind of poetry I want views itself, views its forms as subaltern, a dissent against dominant and standardizing, normalizing modes of conduct, thought, and writing. As loyal as I am to my poetry friends, I am more loyal to the fantasy of poetry, which makes for difficulties. I am nothing without my friends and family, but this nothing is the ground of my poetry and my love. Insert one dollar to illuminate this passage. Coins only. <laughs> we can either learn to live with difference, or we will die the same. The necessity of unnaming, echo, the unnaming of necessity. You took the mouth out of my words. Yesterday's omelet is tomorrow's bride. We've got to take the bull by the horse. At the end of the day is a beginning. I don't write Jewish, but Jewish won't stop writing me after Thomas Sayers Elliot, after Thomas Sayers Ellis. Make it old, Hagis <laughs> von Vincino. Zen Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, Zen Cohen. Why empty what is empty or fill what is full? What is empty is full and what is full is empty. Only a fool confuses the two. Each sunset I look to see if my dead body is floating down the river. Appearances notwithstanding, I am not a performing seal. My being is not just human. Once they let people like me in, it lost all its allure. <laughs> Almost everyone disappoints me. I disappoint myself, but not you. And the Lord said, I am. Silence inside of silence, space inside of space, shadow inside of shadow, loss inside of loss, fold inside of fold, cracks inside of crack, mutation inside of mutation, multiplicity inside one, fantasy inside imagination, sound inside sense, difference inside difference, absence inside presence, the discarded inside waste, finitude inside infinity, insincerity inside sincerity, helplessness inside capacity, noise inside music, figuration inside abstraction, swerve inside trajectory, failure inside success, non-existence inside existence, the ungiven inside the given, existence inside desert, the wild inside wilderness, and not even that, and not yet that, not ever that. 
I've run out of bridges to burn. For several years, I've been looking for a misplaced book by a poet whose work I did not know. When I find the book, I put it in a nearly inaccessible place on my bookshelf, satisfied. I didn't want to read the poems, but to locate them. And people ask me, Rabbi, is it an obligation for Jews to go to a Chinese restaurant on Christmas? No, I tell them. It's a tradition. The obligation is in keeping the tradition. <laughs> a rabbi and a priest meet in a bar. What's your worst transgression, asked the rabbi. I had sex with an underage couple. She got pregnant, so I got her an abortion. How about you? I ate a bologna sandwich with cheese. <laughs> the senses thus have become theorists in their immediate practice, Marx. Which is to say, the spectrum of the senses has been reduced to one alienated, reified sense, possessing, having, owning. Poetry could be a momentary, out of time, liberation of the senses, including the senses of identity as property. Only, only by demonstrating that it is the function of poetry itself to communicate right ideas can you argue that wrong ideas invalidate poetry without opening the doors wide to the consequences you as a convinced anti-fascist and anti-authoritarian would dislike. Archibald McLeish, 1950. Attempts to defend poetry from unconventionality are applauded loudest by those who hate poetry. Opacity is the parasol of mind in motion and soul in action. What, what's there to be saw, I saw, but I never could see what was only heard. Echo location, I find who I am bouncing sounds off who you are. Heard echoes are sweet, but unheard echoes will get you every time. The act of hearing with your own ears. That's no sensibility. That's my consciousness. This place is lit up like Luna Park, my father would say, turning off the lights. Hope is a grave. My son doesn't like it when I repeat things. But I am never sure he hears me. As Rabbi Silken Sailing says, you can bring a fish to water, but you can't make it sing. Rabbi Okum, the law of the human is not the same as the law of the fish. Rabbi Bat Shalom, birds fly to a different feather. Rabbi Ignaz, leave well enough alone. Is Jewishness defined by something God reportedly told Moses 3,000 years ago, or having a pastrami sandwich at the stage delicatessen? It turns out God told Moses, have the tongue. <laughs> I use comedy to leaven the harshness of historical judgment and to foment a dialectical turning away that allows ever new turning toward, tunings toward. Truth blinds, but even worse, binds, in which case it is, in which case it is truth, both evermore and nevermore. Laugh free or die. <laughs> I hear you, but I'm not listening. Jesus tries on a crown of thorns in the mirror. <laughs> Do you think it makes me look too Jewish? <laughs> Ralph Mannheim's joke by Kate Mannheim. <laughs> there are
There's a poem in Topsy Turvy called No Then There Then. Gig Ryan in the Australian Book Review recognized Augustine, echoed by Gertrude Stein's There Is No There There, as the source of the title. Non enum erat tunc, ubi non erat tempus. No then truly was, where no time was. So maybe no there then when no time there. Augustine imagines the absence of God who is the foundation of time. Echo Wallace Stevens in the plain sense of things. The absence of imagination had itself to be imagined. There's no here, here. Nothing without imagination or the imagination of nothing. Two birds land on a wire. Robin and Dodo. What are you doing on my wire? asked Dodo. It's not your wire. It doesn't have your name on it, said the Robin. Whatever has no name written on it is mine, Dodo replied. Then is the wind yours? The sky? The clouds? Only if I am sitting on them, like I'm sitting on this wire. Then is the wire mine too? when I am sitting on it with you, asked Robin. Yes, and so is the sky yours when you fly through it, the clouds when you touch them, the wind when it blows over you. I am the queen and king of my imagination where I exercise sovereignty, citizen of mind, subject of none, inside hope is despair, while despair is hope suspended. Never say hope. Never stop hoping. The way taken is not the way. The name spoken is not the name. Tao Te Ching. You can hold yourself back from the world's sorrow. You're free to do it, and it's well within your nature. But maybe holding back is the single sorrow you're capable of avoiding. Kafka. We sell boxes, don't we? Everything is a disappointment, and if it's not a disappointment, that's a disappointment too. <laughs> I'm for a quantum identity politics. Identity is a plural event. We need to change the settings, settings. An Afro-pessimist and a Judeo-pessimist walk into a bar. Think of the millions incinerated last century by Western civilization trying to find its true self, said the Afro-pessimist. Think of the millions yet to be, think of the millions yet to be dehumanized in the century ahead said the Judeo-pessimist. He was so old, even his future was behind him. <laughs> Apodictic or apoplectic? Apophatic or apostrophe? Apocalyptic or apocryphal? I can hardly say why I have taken to crying lately. I never used to cry. Thomas Hardy, far from the madding crowd. Ye might have some queer kind of hurt yourself. Yeah, can't trust. Yeah, can't never tell. Where is your located? Stephen Crane, the red badge of courage. Animality is the condition. Animality is a condition, not a world view. Now's not noise. Stop putting mouths in my words. Resistance precedes presence, not speech, but speech sounds. The absence of translation had itself to be translated. In the middle was a world, and the world was with the word, as a mother's with a child. And the words formed worlds, even as the worlds formed words. This worldly being, 
this world. In the middle was muddle, absence becoming present, there becoming here. Only this and nothing more. In other words, the absence of absence is not presence. In other words, rationality without fantasy is tyranny. In other words, presence is a fantasy of imagination. In other words, if you can't imagine the imaginary, it isn't imaginary. In other words, reality and the imaginary are codependent. In other words, the imaginary is not imaginary. In other words, beyond the imaginary is the everyday. In other words, fantasy abhors a vacuum. God speeds away or after. Even labyrinths have fathers. Perhaps you may feel, as I do, almost powerless. That almost, in almost perilous, is where we meet. It's the place of our solidarity for Banaz Amani. We is an other, many others. I is not you or even me. Ethnicity is a trap if you take it as an end rather than a given. The truth of the matter is revealed in hermetic texts that are long lost, and the problem is that it's a secret that they are lost. I hope I am not spilling the beans, but when I say I, I mean them. Arts not promised lands but wilds, just as truths not holes but edges. Pataquirics, not what said but what animates saying, not thought but what conditions thought. Not that which is form, but that which shapes forming. Not understanding, but that which stands under. The mind is a blazing that gives off embers. Will Alexander, inscription to me in the contortion, whispers. May poems be tense of meeting, close encounters with the wilderness of language, sites of unsettlement. Make it new is so yesterday, and make it the same is like totally today. That's why yesterdays and tomorrows are necessary resistance to the tyranny of the times. Poetry is dead when the people saying that are killing it. The kinds of poetries I want are dead to those who hate poetry. In that hatred is poetry's freedom. Try your tears. It was long ago. Then long ago already was too late for your <coughs> weeping. Henry Roth called it sleep. If she goes without food, I will be hungry. If she is beaten, I will cry out in pain. If she rests not, I will not sleep. If you kill her, I will die. What you remember is what you can't forget. The only thing permanent is evanescence, and that's illusory. I am I not your ass on whom you've always written numbers 2230. In other words, don't put the horse before the cart if you want to tread water. Every Friday buries a Thursday. Ulysses. The influence of anxiety. Poetry is a lost cause, which is how it matters. Nobody reads poetry, they say, but that nobody may matter more to our culture than those who promote hatred of poetry and disdain toward a phantom avant-garde that is a projection of their abjection. Not double consciousness, plural consciousness. In other words, if somebody won't do it, maybe nobody will. In other words, poetry has consequences. In other words, I don't stand on principle, I sleep with it. Deuteronomy 2830. <laughs> Building a house you can't inhabit, the Deuteronomist curse for disobedience may also be a utopian possibility for freedom. 
call it diasporic double consciousness, an ever reforming alien nation. Beep, beep, toot, toot, lia da da da, beep, beep, toot, toot, lia da da da, said Robin and your sisters. He, nay, ni, here I am. Not yet. Not now. May flights of mezcal take you to your rest. <laughs> For a while, um, there's still more snacks out there. Um, our next reading is on November 4th. You might see one of these nice uh, postcards to take with you on, on the way home. Lorraine Lupo and Paul Maziar will be right here again on November 4th. Thank you again for this evening. Good night, everybody. Thanks.